Dawn of War. The title that introduced me to the Warhammer universe back in high school and is most likely the cause of that F I got in Spanish. It's finally getting its third iteration and I've actually had a chance to sit down and chat with the devs about the title. Keep in mind everything you're seeing here is work in progress. Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Captain Shaq and welcome to Dawn of War 3. What we know so far. This year's E3 held quite a few surprises for me on the show floor, but my number one game that I flew 2,300 miles to see was this classic return from Relic. After the initial gameplay trailer was revealed at this year's PC Gamer Live show, yeah, that's me in the blue shirt in the second row, you guys had some concerns, and rightfully so. The trailer had some pretty massive FPS drops and was seriously cut down for time. The gameplay footage you're seeing now is that same mission, but with zero frame drops and running smooth. Also, it's the entire mission. So here's the quick rundown. Dawn of War 3 sees the return of the Blood Ravens chapter of the Space Marines, led by Commander Gabriel Angelos. Yes, this is the continuation of his story from the past games. In this demo, we had a much better look at some of the base building aspects. Not enough for my taste, but we did get to see them put a barracks down right next to an HQ in classic Space Marine style. This demo focused squarely on the Space Marines, basically kicking the ever-living crap out of the Eldar. What's immediately noticeable is the sheer scale of Dawn of War 3. The camera is pulled well back compared to Dawn of War 2 and absolutely dwarfs Dawn of War 1's original camera distance. That zoom out is necessary due to the scale Relic is going for. A basic genetically modified super soldier or space marine is seven to nine-ish feet tall. This thing is bigger. Way bigger. That's the Imperial Titan. Players can have three hero units as part of their army. Solaria and her giant walking torso of weaponized death has to be the most striking. Commander Gabriel Angelos makes his return with his fairly impressive hammer, and a squad of Marines clad in Terminator armor make up the third shown elite hero unit. Each hero unit is a special ability that can turn the tide of battle through either direct combat or just influencing the army around them. Commander Angelos can call in a monster orbital bombardment that does more damage and gets bigger with each kill that it gets. Solaria is a super elite unit, driving her Imperial Titan. She can use her Gatling guns to cut through infantry or drop a missile barrage on targets from afar. This ability has one of the most satisfying sound effects when used. But it's not just hero units that get these special abilities. Each race out of the three at launch has a defining mechanic. The only one revealed so far is the Space Marine's drop pod, which fits perfectly with the lore. Space Marines can drop reinforcements into the field at a moment's notice if they can see the drop location. It's something we've seen before, but now it's the primary building and reinforcement method for the Space Marine Army. It's not just a side mechanic. This mission that we've seen so far takes place somewhere decently far into the campaign. At this point, the player already has access to assault marines, super elite units, other high-end units. I asked about the campaign and if we'd see a linear story or a more open style campaign like the overmap of planets from Dawn of War Soulstorm, and was surprised to learn that the story would be linear, but it'd be told from the point of view of all three races. So one mission would start you off, say, as the Space Marines, the next, you could be playing the orcs and seeing the effects of the last mission, but from their perspective, continuing on the story one race at a time. The next one could be the Eldar's point of view, and you get to see what happened between the story point for the Space Marines, story point for the orcs, and now the Eldar. This type of flowing narrative is something we've not seen in Dawn of War before, and I'm looking forward to it. I asked about the past RPG mechanics with hero characters that could be leveled up, chosen skills, and then items that they could gear up with, and they said there would be some customization in there, but they're not sure exactly what they're going to do, how it's going to work. There will be, though, the Army Painter. It's a must for a Dawn of War title. Speaking of armies, the base game is going to have the Orcs, the Space Marines, and the Eldar as the starting races. But what about the other well-known sides? What about the Chaos, for instance, the Tau, or, you know, the best ones, the Imperial Guard? Well, I asked if we'd expect some of Relic's classic high-quality expansion packs after this launch and was met with a, well, if it title does well, then yeah, probably they would make those expansions, but as of right now, they are fully focused on Dawn of War 3, so I couldn't get any confirmation. But I'm like I said, Imperial Guard, it's a must. Come on, guys, I need Bane Blades in my life. 
So let's talk game mechanics. What's the big difference from this and past titles? Well, for one, like I said, the scale. Relic is going for a much larger battlefield this time around. Where Dawn of War 1 had decent sized fights and Dawn of War 2 focused more on small scale skirmishes, Dawn of War 3 is going for big. Unit caps are still being figured out, but I don't think the battles we've seen so far really convey the scale they're gonna be going for. Which leads us to the next biggest change, cover. In Dawn of War 2 or in Company Heroes, they had a dynamic cover system for infantry. That's been removed in favor of a simplified system that reminds me of Dawn of War 1's area-based cover. If you remember those points where you'd stick infantry in them and they'd get a, they would up their chance to survive and they'd take more damage. Well, in Dawn of War 3, you get points on the map like what you're seeing now. They're capturable cover areas. Putting infantry inside will kick on a shield that can block a certain amount of range damage. This can be countered using melee characters like Assault or Terminator Marines, or by outright just destroying the shield structure. When I asked about this change, the dev explained it was done to help limit the micromanaging of individual squads, which was hard to do with a battle of these scales. I think this feature, or maybe removal of this mechanic, is one of the biggest hangups I have so far with Dawn of War 3, at least in this early rendition. I love Company of Heroes, and I really dug Dawn of War 2's cover system. I can understand the change due to the scale, it's just having these randomly placed cover shields seems odd. Of course, my channel being what it is, I had to ask about modding support. Mods have been a part of Dawn of War for ages now. It's a really important part of the franchise. I talked to Relic and they agree the modding community is incredibly important. So what about modding support then? Well, I can confirm there will be modding support for modders. What form that takes is still being determined. I pressed on asking about the workshop support, but was met with a we're still figuring it out kind of answer. One thing I will note, Relic is listening to your feedback, so if you see something you don't like, hit up the Relic forums and let them know. Leave a comment in this video and I'll gather up all the feedback and see that it gets to the devs next time I have a chance to talk with them. Relic has made, hands down, some of the best real-time strategy titles ever. Homeworld, Company Heroes, Dawn of War, and I can't wait to see what they pull with Dawn of War 3. I plan on going into the individual units of the Blood Ravens in a separate video in the next few days as well, and some lore stuff. So if you're in a Dawn of War, or you just like sci-fi gaming and modding goodness, then you found the right channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.